I hear user story and tell a story a lot. And user stories can be great, but sometimes they get wordy. And, you know, we talk about meandering. Do you see that a lot? I see tons, paragraphs of every step. And mind you, a user story is only usually useful if you can personally tell the story. They're often very hard to do when, the, when you're not there with the deck. Ed, can, can you explain a little bit the difference between the deck that you send out to investors that's naked versus the one you present? Sure. So it's just straightforward. One has a narrator, so you have you to present. <laughs> yeah. And the other one, you don't. So yeah. an introductory screener deck is going to be maximum 10, maybe 12 slides. If you can get it lower, that'd be great. For them, the investor to say, wow, that makes total sense. I'm going to send this along to the associates, or I'm going to say, hey, please book me for a meeting. I'd like to see the rest. Then you're going to have an actual pitch deck. That's where you get to talk and you want the focus to be on you, not necessarily them reading a paragraph of text and having to bounce back and forth, or you droning on. Like you're not reading an audio book to them. This is not a book reading. You're not going to just read the text and then keep flipping the next slide. They're going to say, well, why can't I just read this ahead of time? So you're going to be there live. And so your slides are going to operate fundamentally differently to elicit conversation and get them to ask questions. Those are the two differences. You bet, you bet. And, and the reality is your deck is going to be a standalone. It's, it's going to stand on by itself 90% of the time because it's you're always going to send it ahead of time without you. And 10% of the time you're going to present it. So the user stories sometimes are challenging because you're not there to kind of tell the whole story, the narrative. And on a slide deck, that's 12 slides that have two sentences per slide. Sometimes it's hard to tell that story. That said, I also don't know that you need to say that much here. Let's go back to the slide, Ed. There's a lot here that I want to say though. So for the different types of services, we definitely have to talk about that because we've been saying it at a high level. We, we got to nail it home. I almost don't hate maybe using some of the real estate on that solution slide for the services. I feel like we could maybe establish some of that here. I would almost rather see that grid where we're seeing peace of mind and increased home value. Because if we're talking about home maintenance, what a great opportunity to use what's essentially some dead space below that to nail what the services themselves are. Totally agree. And then perhaps when we go, let's flip back, Ed, if you, if you wouldn't mind, to this part, maybe we start to talk more about the mechanics of this thing. Because I don't think there's a lot of narrative that we need around gutter cleaning and appliance filters. I think as soon as we see that, that that's tied to home maintenance, that feels pretty tight. I think once we get into some of these really deep kind of what the product is, this idea that we're doing predictive maintenance, that we've got this trusted embedded subcontractor network, that's really what like the depth of the product is. That's probably what I'd want to see on full display here and maybe like, kind of lighten this up a little bit and focus it. What do you think, Ed? I agree with you 100%. You know what I like about your suggestion? You see this whole section right here in terms of this, what you, what you got here, what Will highlighted, all these services. Yeah. That to me illustrates the problem very well in the sense that I'm sitting here as a homer going gutter cleaning appliance filters, this and that, ah, you know, type thing. That's part of the problem. That is part of the problem here is, man, I got all these things I have to be thinking about and I don't have the bandwidth to do that. So if you told me, then here's the problem and your solution consolidates all that in a predictive maintenance subscription package and tells me when I should get all that stuff done, there your problem solution are connected. You know, Ryan, this might've been too late to introduce that thing. That, that, that might that might be your gold right there, right? Just, you know, as a visual, there, there might be some cooler ways to introduce that visual. Like, like just, again, this is the designer in me. The designer in me might see some iconography around some of those nodes, around landscaping, roof cleaning, et cetera, just to make it, you know, a little bit more visually unique. But to your point, Ed, I think visually when I saw all those, I could really connect with the kind of expansiveness of how many things those are. And they're frustrated and they're expensive and, and they're hard to maintain. Again, I, I think there's no question that this is a big problem. And I think this is something that's really easy to identify with. So I, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. But I think this is a separate concept. When we get to this slide specifically, I think there's some cool stuff in here. I like this AI-powered predictive maintenance. I don't honestly believe it's AI-powered. I'm, I'm not giving you a hard time about your business. I'm kidding. But like, I think it doesn't have to be that AI-powered. I think that like your hot tub stuff could just be scheduled. I just think like the fact that it exists at all, that someone's paying attention to any of it, just needs to exist. The fact that you're getting notifications, it just this is kind of a funny story. When I bought my house like 26 years ago, the guy was like, and so you have something called an aerator inside your septic uh, tank. And you need to like, you know, reset it at whatever time there's like a, an alarm that's going to go off when you need to do it. Otherwise, the whole thing is going to like blow up or something. And I was like, you know, 26 or something. I was like, oh, really? And so the alarm goes off and my, my fix for it was to flip the breaker, to just turn the alarm off. So I'd never have to listen it again. And that, so that thing was off for like 10 years. <laughs> 
that caused a massive problem. And I, and I remember thinking like, I probably should have been paying attention or had a service like this. So somebody way smarter than me could have like, my house just went to hell in a handbasket because I didn't pay attention to anything. And I think like how great it would have had to be like the, all these reminders for people smarter than me that would have figured all this stuff out. I want to ask you a question, Will, about this AI, because it's a common theme that's coming up with our founders. Before I do that, if you have any other questions, hit that FAQ box to the chat. Jen, I'm going yeah, to leave great. you- I love when you guys ask. I'm going to leave you to organize it and be ready if we need to answer some questions. But Will, this whole concept, everybody's slapping AI on everything right now. It's AI driven, AI powered, AI this, AI that. And we call it AI washing. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, investors are tired of yeah. looking at all this thing, unless you're open AI, unless you're AI X or X AI, or whatever Elon Musk is, et cetera. Yeah. All this, it's just, it's created so much noise. Same thing with, we're putting everything on the blockchain. Everything's an NFT, et cetera. Will, what is your recommendation for founders to communicate? Well, even decide, do we even add AI to this? And then two, how do you communicate it? I, I, I think it's, it's become table stakes. I mean, again, yes. Like people have replaced the word software to being AI. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm not giving Ryan a hard time. I, maybe it is AI. I, I'm, I'm kidding. What I'm saying is I think the bar for what is AI, to your point, has gotten extremely high, right? So if you're going to say we're an AI company, you got to have a lot of AI. Like, and, and we see a ton of stuff. And some of the stuff I'm seeing right now, like what is now considered AI is way out there. Saying that we have an API out to chat GPT or something like that just ain't cutting it anymore. Like you have to be pretty far along. That said, I don't think it hurts you. I just don't, I think it's a lot harder to make that claim among investors than it was say a year or two ago. And, and like, again, I think we hit that same threshold somewhere along the line in crypto where everything was blockchain, right? It was like, well, yes, but it's on the blockchain. And I was like, no, it's not. Like you're taking a concept that makes no sense on the blockchain and just saying <laughs> blockchain because you heard everybody was saying it has to be on blockchain. And this has nothing to do with, with, with what Ryan's doing. I'm just saying generally across the board. I think, I think what you're saying is AI has gotten a little played out in pitch decks. Yeah. And, and I, I think we're kind of hitting that. So if you're going to use AI, make sure that, that you are like inventing some AI, not that you just got some you know, basic use case of it. Okay. And, you know, Ryan's given us a response here, but let me give you just some generic advice. I have the benefit of working on pitch decks through our Thunderbolt Accelerator, seeing how investors respond and what they respond to. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, when someone just says AI driven and they don't explain it, investors aren't responding. But in this case, what everybody wants to know is what is the use case of the AI? So if you're using AI and you can say, we can pull a unique data set, even if you're using ChatGPT, I use a service right now. It's amazing. I'm so in love with this. I think it's going to be the future of billion dollar AI companies. What they allow me to do is plug my stuff into any of the open like language models out there. It gives me like a list of 16 or 17 that I can pick from, the one that works best. And then it reads my stuff and it interacts with me and pre-prompts me. So I'm not, you know, what they call raw dogging prompts and just yeah. you're prompting right in the chat GPT. It's actually assisting my prompts with my information. And so if you have a use case or you can argue and you pitch, this is how we're using open AI. This is how we're using Claude. This is how we're using all these services to read the data and make the experience better or give us insights. Then you're golden. Investors will love that story. But if you just say AI, you know, and again, we're just not throwing this deck under the bus because I'm sure you've explained it in the future. And I know Ryan, he's working with a full AI team. We're yeah. just using this as a general yep. conversation point for all the founders who are going to be listening to this.